there's a recent study that came out of uh, Ken Caldera's lab um, <coughs> that showed that a decent step at meeting terrorist targets um, would imply capital destruction at a scale that is sufficiently large to cause a deep and lasting depression. Uh, and the reason for that is as follows. Uh, emissions from carbon uh, dioxide will have to hit zero around 2050 if we want to meet the Paris targets. And that is if you sort of, I think, unduly believe in negative uh, energy, uh, uh, negative carbon uh, energy. Um, and 2050 and the zero target for 2050 may seem like a long way away, right? That's six, seven elections uh, in the future. That seems the sort of promise that you can make as a politician uh, because you won't be in charge anymore and you won't take the blame. Uh, but 2050 is actually very close, much closer than you think. Some of the cars that will be sold <coughs> that have been sold today, will still be on the road in 2050. And the power plants that were commissioned this year, by 2050, will not even have reached half their economic lifetime. And uh, so if you want to go to zero carbon at that time, you are talking about substantial capital destruction. Um, and since most governments are smarter than ours, uh, and will not deliberately damage their economies, I therefore think that these targets will be missed and we will not go down this uh, particularly uh, economically disastrous route. Um, and I therefore do also not believe that climate policy will do serious economic damage. <coughs> That's all I wanted to say. Over to you. Thank you very much, Richard. I was thinking maybe there could be a brief exchange as they've been dialoguing somehow, uh, touching upon each other's points, even preemptively, <coughs> that would be nice to have maybe a couple of minutes to yeah. to interact again and then yeah. open the floor. Okay. Yeah. Well, just yeah, just to be very very brief because I'm sure there's a whole lot of stuff uh, that people have brought with them. Um, I don't think it's just rich people care about the environment. It, that's taking the the, the 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 medium as the message. I mean, there's 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 so, so much absolutely inspiring environmental activity, motivation around the world. And when people say they want to be, they want their children to be rich, to extend that is the way it's expressed, there are different, my point about growth is, there are different ways of growing. So that's not, it's not a different debate. It's still a debate about how we change our society in order to benefit particular interests. But the main point, Richard, I wanted to ask you about is where we agree, which is on a certain degree of scepticism about the authority of numbers and these technocratic the impulses I think you also mentioned. I, I just, I feel you're being very asymmetric. You, you're you very ready to look at climate science that way, or science in general, you can't, as you're right to say, derive, I think it goes back to Kant, you know, you can't, a fact, do, and it is doesn't derive an ought. You can't do that. It's not just science you can't do that from. But then when you speak of economics, you mentioned it's impossible to achieve. You talked about PV, this wave of PV toxic stuff, certain kinds of evidence you will really assert very strongly, and I've heard you do that with average temperature rise, what that means. So I'm not sure, you're, it's almost as if in your world, the economy is the big thing, which you look at sustainability in relation to the economy, and you look at uh, these other aspects of the energy system in that way. You take the economic figures as given, and then you exercise scepticism about other things. So maybe I'm being unfair, but that's what I think if we're going to have an argument, that would be the main thing about it. Let's be symmetrically sceptical about all this stuff and then look at the politics of climate change. What do societies want to do? Not about what somebody says is impossible or possible. How a lot more things are possible than we give credence for, given the point I made about the way imaginations work inside institutions. So that would be my, my main challenge, I think. I, I'm, I must have not expressed myself very clearly or uh, skipped things. Um, I, I mean, we're always more knowledgeable about our own stuff than about other people's work. And therefore, if you're a good scientist, you should be more critical about your own discipline than about any other discipline because you know so much more. And I definitely do not take any economic model or any economic statistic uh, for that matter for granted. Uh, and because I happen to know what goes into these things, what goes on in these things, and I don't, 
Um, I'm probably more skeptical about these things than uh, many people in the room, Alan, uh, perhaps accepted. Um, <laughs> so, no, I, I, th th that was a wrong impression uh, that I gave. But what I said about photovoltaic panels being chemical based is a matter of chemistry and law. <laughs> the chemistry is that, yes, these materials are in these things, and the law is that this, is this would be classified as chemical waste. Uh, so that is a fact, not a value judgment. If, they, if that confused you, well, um, heavy metal PV. There are there are amorphous silicon PV. That, you know, there's a huge variability. I mean, we can get into that. Of course, of course. You're, course, insisting, you're yeah. insisting you're insisting in a very authoritarian way on that being a fact. When I'm saying it's subject to the same skepticism that you but, exercised earlier. And of course, there's variability in PV panels and <laughs> what these things contain and what they do and and so on and so forth. But as far as I know, all of them would be classified as chemical waste if you bring them to the dump and you can't just uh, put them in the river um, so, or uh, which you your gener generic waste. Well, we shouldn't get into it. And that's a question for engineers rather than for us, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you, you very much. Not more interesting than us. Come on. <laughs> so it would be interesting to have questions from students first. Uh, there's a very wide audience of students and no students, so let's give the floor to students first, and then do you, are you okay with collecting a couple of questions Absolutely. together? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, questions? I mean, guys, statistically, there must be questions. <laughs> yes, Mike. Um, you mentioned very briefly that when societies sort of mature as democracies and become richer, they organize themselves differently. And uh, a lot of times that seems to come with technological change and sort of higher efficiency. And my question is do you think there is actually sort of a shaped relationship between emissions and growth within a country and um, or do you think that countries just start to outsource their pollution at some point? Well I don't think there is that home shape and that is what I tried to make clear that there's these five mechanisms that point in different directions. Uh, I did not mention outsourcing there that obviously complicates the issue uh, but it does not clarify the issue, it just makes the relationship even more ambiguous. Uh, what we definitely have seen in a country like the UK, uh, that for 15 years between uh, 2000 and 2015, uh, politicians were congratulating themselves for reducing CO2 emissions in the UK, whereas the only thing that really went on was that emissions were outsourced to Eastern Europe and East Asia, and emissions were not emissions were actually rising if you look at them on a consumption basis. Um, <clears throat> that said, this does not change the ambiguous relationship between economic growth and any environmental pressure. May I just quickly on that? Um, it's, it's a great question. I, I think that the area, you know, these environmental Kuznets curves that you're talking about are something that are subject to the same kind of constraint on imagination that I mentioned with respect to the science and the economics. So it's, it's to, to say that there is some hard, hardwired deterministic curve that countries will go through as they progress along a growth curve, and the fact that history may or may not, it, it actually is nowhere near as monolithic as it seems, but to the extent that's shown, that could be a contingent feature of the way societies have grown in capitalist economies. So we shouldn't constrain our imaginations that that has to be like, like the, the, the second law of thermodynamics. And innovation debates are just as affected by this idea that, well, you just go, as you implied in your question, to more efficient technologies, and all that's happening is moving along an efficiency frontier, as if efficiency were another number that simply comes out of the machine. And so what I'm trying to talk to is these qualitative capital. Where, what, what's the denominator for efficiency? How is it being measured? In what terms? What kinds of technologies are we talking about? That's much more important than these, I think, debates over these crude aggregates. And when we start seeing it that way, we see much more possibility for sustainable societies from different kinds. It's not about growth, it's about form. The forms of technologies, the forms of institutions. That's really what, I mean, growth is, I don't want to denigrate it, but it depends on those things. And because there's such prestige around you know, numeric, numerical quantitative reasoning, 
we just neglect these crucial qualitative debates around that kind of thing. So that's true of that type of question as it is of the others, I think. Okay, we've got more, one more question. Is there anyone who wants to ask two questions? Mm -hmm. Three questions. Oh, there's a lot. Okay, so <laughs> one, uh, two, and three, and then we collect three more. Um, thank you for that. I, I actually wanted to ask something a bit more um, foundational, let me say. So in, in your short presentation, I'm just quite sure I'm hoping you can kind of elaborate on that. But I felt that there's a number of assumptions, and more dangerously, there are a number of commitments involved um, in the way you were framing things. And these include a sort of commitment to science, to positive science in a way. They also include a commitment to, to, to Europe and, and, and European understanding of political systems. Um, and most dangerously, a commitment to linearity, whereby there was this clear <coughs> movement which included the political and the economic um, and kind of other, other fields whereby you had this very neat um, division of how, th how we go from one, one place to another and then we move on. Um, but what I'm, what I'm <coughs> concerned about is that the majority of the planet is not Europe and is not European. And this is just a really, really, really small part of, of the planet. And across the planet, there are very different epistemologies that would definitely not want to, go, to grow rich, and that would definitely not want to harm nature. And for them, the whole European system of growth is blasphemous. Um, the whole European system of growth goes against their most foundational epistemological axioms and beliefs and, and modes of being in the world. Um, so they would completely disagree with me. They do not want to get rich, and they do not. Maybe poor people in Europe, some poor people in Europe, um, do, but the majority of the planet does it? Um, well, at least uh, the majority of epistemologies in the planet that haven't been colonized, colonized now, don't. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering how you would how, how you would make these statements from, from such a parochial position, from, 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 from such a from, from, from such from within a, um, a European episteme um, about, about something which, which is going to influence everyone on the planet. Thank you. Hi. Um, hi. Thank, thank you for both points of view. Um, so my, my question goes a little bit of background. I was working with climate change projects in New Mexico, and um, some of them were uh, internationally funded, and they were really successful for you know maybe five years up until the moment I left here. So my question is if you actually believe that these type of projects that uh, try to um, get together um, environmental and economical, economic benefits can actually be sustainable, and I mean sustainability over time. Um, not just niche projects that are funded like once, and then what does it take for the, you know, the, um, I don't know, societies to actually take ownership of this and make them work without foreign money, and if it can work for, you know, 20, 30, 50 years to create, uh, you know, like, uh, the carbonized economy. And I just, <coughs> I, I, I might disagree a little bit with uh, you, because I did so that, at least in the case of Mexico, maybe people didn't want to get rich, but they had a vast amount of natural resources, and they were eager to put that into, uh, a sustainable economy in order to have, you know, food in your table. Maybe not get rich, but actually, you know, have an income out of it. Just thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is sort of going to, to Richard's argument about the relative ease of decarbonisation. And I just wondered what you think about the related, currently related question of um, reduction in energy intensity. Like, how low can it go? Can, can you have un, un, unbounded economic growth without a, a corresponding unbounded growth in, in the use of energy? Okay, I think we can start with answering those three and then, yeah. I mean, not easy ones. Really. Um, the uh, last question was the easiest. Okay. And there we are simply have the laws of physics that stand in our way, right? Yeah. Um, so energy intensity cannot go to zero. Uh, depends on what exactly you're thinking about, but there is a, a lower limit. We are far away from that lower limit in many of our current systems, uh, but there is clearly a lower limit, so no, 
you will always need to use energy. Now, using energy is of course not the issue. What matters is the environmental problems that are caused by that energy use rather than the energy use per se. Uh, so if we replace dirty energy with clean energy, I don't see how this could be an environmental issue. And really the constraint is essentially how much energy from the sun can be captured. And we are so far away from capturing 100% of the solar energy that reaches us that I don't see this as a practical limit. Um, <clears throat> The uh, second question was about um, how do you go from foreign, foreign funded projects to, if I understood the question correctly, from foreign funded projects <coughs> to society itself taking over. And the, I mean, it's as simple and as difficult uh, as this that you need to make it in their own interest. Uh, at the moment, climate change is a very particular leap of Europe and that is why we fund, we give money to other people to reduce their CO2 emissions because they themselves seem to care less. Um, <clears throat> but of course as soon as we start offering or as soon as technologies are developed that make it uh, attractive to do things without emitting CO2 then why would they, right? Uh, and we see that happening. Uh, I mean, a couple of years ago, um, the Moroccan government uh, had a subscription out for uh, concentrated solar power, and <coughs> companies offered it for three cents per kilowatt hour. And if you can make electricity from the sun for three cents per kilowatt hour, why would you build a coal-fired power plant which starts at four cents? Or why would you build a gas-fired power plant which starts at six cents? Uh, so as soon as those technologies <coughs> become available, then why would they? And uh, the crux there is not, and, and I mean, yes, these sort of projects may help, may help with our conscience, that uh, maybe seem to be the main reason, may help buy down the technology curve, but as soon as things become commercially attractive, then, and that is what our goal should be, that should be the holy grail of climate policy and other environmental policies. And now the first question was um, uh, perhaps the hardest, perhaps the simplest. Um, it is of course true that I'm European, grew up in Europe. Uh, I don't really see myself uh, somebody who is parochial, but uh, anybody would tell you that. But um, I've, I've, I've traveled places and I've read uh, things and I've talked to people from all over. I don't see myself in that sense as a European or as a, uh, uh, somebody uh, who believes in scientism or who believes in linearity. Uh, I think what you're displaying here uh, is the old romantic notion of the noble Sabbath. Noble Sabbath. Uh, that there's other people out there who are not polluted by our European thoughts and are happy to be abjectly poor. I've never met such a person and I don't think that those, these people uh, really... <coughs> and he's burning to me. Yeah, I can, uh, <laughs> could say a few things. I'm sure a lot of people here yeah, could say a few things. I'll, I'll, be very, I'll be very telegraphic because I think there's plenty of people who want to say things about the issues that are coming up. But on laws... Richard, again, what you just said about the laws of physics, you just did exactly what you say cannot be done. You invoked an ought from an is. You, you, no, we, no, cannot, no. we cannot, you, you, we cannot, you cannot break the laws of physics. Right, but, what does, but what does that mean for action? Like, for instance, that only in less than 10 years ago, the chief scientist of the UK Department of Energy, David Mackay, a neurophysicist who, for some reason, in six months after publishing a nuclear industry funded book, on renewables became the chief scientist of the Department of Energy and Climate Change, and he said it is against the law of physics for the UK to have as much wind power as it currently already has. So these these rules can be. I mean, this is a trivial example. It's amazing how a country can have such a type of view expressed with the voice of a, a chief scientist. But nonetheless, that is the kind of way that that leads. So I think it's highly problematic to invoke the laws of physics in that way. On on the questions on. Uh, on, on climate change and, and, and achieving achieving these goals, I, I, I should maybe for me it is the single most important environmental issue in the world. It's not the only one, as you rightly say. 
Uh, but no, very few people actually do say that. It's rolled together with everything else. But what I worry about is how much that issue, think about other environmental issues over decades that led to sustainability, the environmental side of sustainability, were won. And many of them were won. Pesticides, heavy metals, uh, halogenated hydrocarbons, chlorine, bleach, uh, chlorine um, bleaches and chlorinated uh, plastics, uh, offshore waste incineration, issue after issue through the 70s and 80s was won at a tactical level still persist in some ways. How were they won? They were not won by doing models, huge models from science, predicting how they should, asserting the science, do what the science says, as the slogans now say. They were won by values and interests, by overt political mobilisation. And I think if climate change were motivated by hopes, to go to the, the second question, hopes about the kinds of society we want to live in, rather than some voice of science, which is under the control of whoever funds it, saying, you can't do this, you can do this, we would have won it already. The way the markets are performing is absolutely amazing. I think you slightly belittled a little bit on renewable energy. Um, how do you sustain these activities? I think the SDGs are crucial. They're much more, I mean, it's, it's, you mustn't romanticise the SDGs. They're highly, no, uh, highly compromised in many ways. But that plurality of values, which the economists called, made them the stupid development goals, are actually the greatest, <coughs> the greatest asset to, to issues like the ones you raise in Mexico, how to sustain these activities, because they demand political engagement, they demand uh, deliberation, argumentation, contestation, because of their plurality. So they combine metrics with space for political debate, and that's what is really needed, an environment in which, it doesn't matter a particular initiative rise and fall, but an environment in which a vibrant democratic stimulus is given to more and more initiatives, which can flock have flocking behaviour to them. That's what, don't, let's not try and make some particular things survive. Uh, let's, let's try and have a society in which a, a types of things can replace each other. And I think the SDGs, for all their flaws, help encourage that to the extent it's picked up rather than overbearing technical discourse. And then on the coloniality point, I think it's very well made. And it's not, it, no matter where, the coloniality, these deep structures that globalisation is entrenching even more, are exactly why, you know, why I think the way I do and Richard thinks the way he does. We're not, we can't claim to escape from them. What we can do is just have a bit of humility about the extent to which our deepest imaginations are shaped by long-run power structures in the world of the kind you, you talked about. Thank you very much. Another round of questions. I've seen, so I think there was a question here, question here, question mm -hmm. here. Anyone from this side? Okay, so we got one, two, three. <coughs> The, the argument between, in fact, the two of you. But um, I wonder, I, I, I'm also trying to think about this issue of the economic growth versus environment. You, um, is Richard? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Richard tends to be clear that the richer people, he used the word people, not nations, tends to care about the environment a little more. But now, could it be that this debate has already, in fact, been, uh, been decided at some point uh, silently? I ask that question because looking at, um, let's take the example of the US, they want their industries back at the same time, they walk out of the, 
the Paris Agreement. You go into the developing countries, uh, every government has economists and environmentalists. The environmentalists have problems securing money to be able to invest in environmental conservation. It is because the economists and the government we have to put money. Uh, Andrew talks about a lot that is going on at the uh, grassroots level. Uh, you say there's lots of conservation work going on in there. I totally agree with that. But it is most of it is foreign funded. So it looks to me that uh, while we can have debates like this uh, about uh, whether or not it's economy <coughs> or economic growth or, uh, or, or environmental conservation, the debate can only be here, but in practice, at the government level, where the reality is, the decision has been made. It's about economic growth. So developing countries focus on exploiting their resources. Developed countries can look back and say, wow, this is the deep damage we made. We can slow down on it. But in reality, it's because they have the choice. They can slow down. It's not because it's a, it's a, you know, a value that they, they have, they have the option of. Do the developing countries have the option? <coughs> Thank you very much. Third question. Um, today we had a seminar which was basically on this uh, issue. And when we actually arrived at like, practical means to like enact the social consciousness in like affecting these changes, um, we kind of arrived at dot 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 revolution, which I thought was such a fundamental thing. So my question to you guys is, um, what do you think the practical means of building in terms of popular support against that overbearing technocracy, overbearing uh, political mobilisation and coercive control, and insisting it must be served in terms of growth uh, and reinforcing that incumbent status quo? Where do you both locate the effective means of building popular support for injecting that plurality of values in like a meaningfully transformative way to like, our social imagination yeah. uh, these issues and modern politics in general? I'm going to pass that question to Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in the work. I, I did not understand the question. Um, I was too quick in suggesting that rich people care about the environment and poor people do not. That is what I said, but that is not what was in my head that I should have said. Uh, because if you ask an, an abstract question to poor people, even desperately poor people, if there were no resource constraints, would you care for the environment? The answer would be yes. But um, the condition of poverty is such that they cannot express this concern that they have for the environment. If uh, you are worried about feeding your children, then that is your first priority. And you don't care about the damage to the environment that you do. Uh, but if you don't worry, like me, about feeding your children, then you can express your care about the environment. That is what I meant to say, but that's not what I said, so I, I should apologize. Uh, to the first question, uh, this is again the Noble Sabbath, right? Um, there is very little support in the archaeological uh, record or in the historical record or in the paleo record to suggest that indigenous people somehow lived in harmony or balance with nature. There is absolutely no evidence for that. There's actually a very long history going back tens of thousands of years about environmental destruction by humans. If you look at the population of humans, uh, the population of Australia by humans, not the other way around, um, you see extinction of megafauna. If you look at the uh, march of humans into the Americas, you see extinction of megafauna, right? So there is absolutely no evidence that this is the case. I object to the term indigenous here uh, as some sort of contrast to me as a European. Uh, I happen to come from a part of the world where historical records are good. So my family record has been traced 15 generations into uh, the past and my family hasn't moved outside of a circle of 16 kilometers for 500 years. So I am indigenous. And I don't think that many Africans, if we know uh, about the history of migration in Africa, uh, can say that they are that indigenous, right? And not as indigenous as perhaps I am. Um, the other thing I'd like to say about this, uh, if you look at the so 
supposedly imbalanced with nature uh, type of communities, and you look at their behavior, and you spoke about villages. If we look at what they want and what they do, and we take as what they do as an expression of what they want, then they're trying to get out as quickly as they can, which suggests that the life that they have that you sketch as idyllic uh, is perhaps and is not perhaps idyllic in their eyes, and they can't wait to get out. Okay. okay. Um, on on the, the point about in, indigenous, I mean, actually, I, I should say, I think you make a good point, Richard, about the dangers of romanticizing. And that's tied in my head, I may be wrong about this, to the depoliticization that goes on on all sides. So I think the Pleistocene megafauna and what happened and the, and the radically different kinds of societies that have actually had, have conditioned their, all creatures, never mind humans, con condition their environments. Environments are not static. That imagination of static climate, static environments, is a major, it's a, it's a fixation of modernity. It's a, colonial, it's a colonial imagination that somehow the world is fixed other than what we do or should do. So I think you make a good point there. But indigeneity is not, I mean, indigeneity is in the world as it is. It's a political term, at least as I understand it. It's not a very uh, sophisticated understanding. But it's about the globalizing modernity in all its forms and the precious value of radically different ways of living in the world. So not a claim that some sort of pristine, romantic uh, quality automatically to be afforded, but just the value of those different ways of being in the world, once you escape this hegemony of modernity, is incredibly important. And so valuing, it doesn't matter how far you move, if, you are, if your imagination is as constrained as both of us evidently are by our um, cultural origins, then, you, then the value of that comes even more. So on the, the point about, your, your point about um, the, the problem that this issue of rich and poor, and I don't want to simplify it, and it's easy for an extremely privileged demographic like me to give some sort of glib answer. And the world is complicated, and there's a lot of it I just don't understand. But I do, I am cautious about this argument. It, it serves such expedient interests, not just in northern interests vis a vis southern, but within global south, all kinds of interests to say, no, it's okay, we don't. <laughs> You know, there is not such a reason for worrying about this among a population supposedly only interested in growth as we, the elite, determine it. It's a dynamic I'm very familiar with in, in discourses I do feel I know about, and I am very suspicious. And, and the idea that, then, as a general rule, I mean, that just the and from indigenous peoples themselves, for instance, who could hardly be poorer in monetary terms, but are inspirationally leading struggles against all kinds of environmental harm in biodiversity. How can one say that's not, you know, that is massive environmental, environmental interventions in the world of a crucial kind at the moment. Environmental justice issues. Again and again, it's been issues for workers, local people have brought to attention, attention to it. They're just not listened to. So I think we can be misled by, yes, elite 